tiny town events. In June of 1955, as I was driving home from spending two long weekdays at a business seminar, at somewhere close to 9 p.m., with no big towns around, my engine overheated and I had to stop the car. Just ahead, a little group of lights would beckon me, so I began the journey to the only choice there was. I'll admit I couldn't have told you what the town was called. I'd only driven through the place, like everybody does, when doing so would save some time as I would make the trek from where I lived to work-related meetings here and there. But always being focused on my being there on time, about what lay between the stops, like most, I didn't care. A slightly cool but gentle breeze became a sweet companion as I embarked on what I knew would actually do me good. And I meandered slowly through the solitude and calm, while sharing thoughts with only stars, until, too soon, I stood at the edge of town where, right away, the breeze grew sweeter, with sounds most often heard at night, when life is winding down. A favorite tune from years ago had wafted out to greet me, evoking thoughts of waltzing as I drifted into town. Like a scent, it filled the air, but teased the ear instead. And glad to let the soft seduction lure me to its source, deep within my soul became the compass for my journey, as anxious, unanticipated thoughts would chart my course. In my mind I saw the smiles of warm, inviting people. I'd heard the tales about the types that live in tiny towns. The porches looked inviting, and the music was delightful. But thinking you can judge a place by merely sights and sounds is a trifle foolish, so I briefly stopped to ponder. What if they're afraid of finding someone they don't know standing on their porch so late at night and asking questions? And where's the wisest place a man in trouble ought to go? Being probably ten blocks wide and maybe twenty long, a faint but clear suspicion fought its way into my mind. Even though I knew, somewhere, the help that I was needing lay within those houses and was simply mine to find, how was I to know which one? Though no two were the same, I saw no indications that there was a perfect choice. But as I stood there contemplating how a man could tell, the sweet, enchanting answer that I sought would find a voice. Hello, young man. You surely picked a nice night for a walk. There are so many stars tonight, it takes your breath away. But unprepared to chit-chat with a stranger, in the dark, I quickly turned to face the sound with nothing nice to say. Staring through the void from whence the friendly comment came, I paused for just an instant, this would give me time to think. And then, at last, to no reply, the gentle voice resumed. And if you listen very closely, you can hear them blink. Slowly it would permeate my unsuspecting mind that I was in the presence of a tiny town event. On the porch of that old house, from off a rocking chair, that tiny town remarked, would serve to show me what they meant by claims that only tiny towns, with good old-fashioned ways, provide the taste of days gone by for those who feel the need. Their lives, to some, seem so mundane, and yet most never leave. They know a special happiness. They are a special breed. Only briefly wondering what the best thing was to say, and needing help the way I did, and knowing how they are, I quipped the first thing I could think of, something in the way of, I've been walking quite a while, had trouble with my car. May I use your telephone? I'd like to call a station. They'll probably need a wrecker. I just hope it's not too late. Yes, of course, no problem, dear, the gentle voice replied. But I'm afraid 
If you need help, you're going to have to wait. Thelma usually doesn't open up till almost noon. When summer comes, she takes a bunch of kids who love to fish out to Miller's Pond to spend the morning having fun. We're making homemade ice cream. Come on in and have a dish. And if you need a place to stay, there's plenty room upstairs. All our kids have moved away. There's only me and Ed. Oh, my goodness, thanks, I said, but I just can't impose. I stood there stunned. I couldn't believe she'd offered me a bed. I'll just use the phone and call my wife to let her know. Then walk on in and get a room. But thank you, just the same. You just get on in here, while the ice cream's good and cold, she tenderly insisted. She didn't even know my name. Pinkerton has never had a genuine motel. We've got a church, a doctor, and a pretty nice cafe. Breakfast at Luella's isn't bad, but mine's much better. And Ed may be tickled pink if you would care to stay. Like a book or movie, where the past is brought to life, I felt the warmth and kindness of an age from long ago. They giggled when I teased them. If they can't repair my car, perhaps I'll take a taxi to the airport when I go. When we'd finished laughing, and I'd grabbed myself a chair, Ed stood up and chortled, Bertha makes the greatest pie. You just sit right there and I'll go cut us all a piece. Her blushing touched my heart, as did the twinkle in her eye. Wrestling with their quaintness, I was cautious with my words. I didn't want to hurt them with sarcastic-sounding cracks. And deep inside I reasoned that these two were very special. I knew the strong and honest man makes up for what he lacks with attributes that only those who know him come to see. And though he seemed quite feeble, and he had to use a cane, I could tell that Ed was strong, the quiet kind of man that's quick to show his tender side and works to hide his pain. And Bertha was the perfect wife for someone just like Ed. Her gentle, sweet demeanor spoke of wise and tender ways. And you could see the love they'd shared for many, many years was helping to sustain them as they coursed their autumn days. After we had eaten homemade ice cream covered pie, a struggling Bertha crossed the room and turned the wireless down. That was what I heard, I said, while walking down the highway. The music was just beautiful as I came into town. This is really kind of you to let me stay the night. You have to let me pay you for the place to stay and all. Oh, my heavens, Bertha laughed. We couldn't take a penny. I see it's getting rather late. You'd better make your call. My eyes would moisten briefly as they stood there holding hands. And Bertha softly told me, Son, stop making such a fuss. We're really glad to have you stay. Breakfast is at six. And we ain't got no doubt at all. You'd do the same for us. And after telling Connie that the car had broken down, and I'd be staying over in a town with no motel, Ed and Bertha smiled to hear me say, I love you too. And by the time the call had ended, everyone could tell that I was actually feeling pretty good about my plight. And when I turned and said to them, You know, I'm awfully fond of fishing, but I don't suppose you'd know if Thelma's bunch would mind if one more tagged along to fish on Miller's Pond? Bertha's eyes were watering as she reached to touch my arm. Of course they won't, she softly said. And son, are you in luck? There's always lots of extra poles. I'll call her after breakfast and let her know she'll need to swing on by here with the truck. I'm sure you'll catch a lot of fish, and when she brings you home, we'll fry them up right here and have a good old-fashioned dinner. You know, they say that eating fish is good for losing weight, but me and Ed eat lots of fish, and we ain't got no thinner. 
There it was again, another tiny town event. The things they said and how they said them warmed me up inside. And I'll tell you a secret. When I went to bed that night, I said a little thank you prayer because my car had died. The ice cream was fantastic and the music soft and sweet. The breakfast was delicious and I've never slept so good. The soft hard water shower had a fragrance all its own. And when the truck arrived to fetch me, like she said it would, seven giggling children filled the box with happy smiles as Ed and Bertha watched an eager city boy jump in. And we would head for what turned out to be, without a doubt, for me, as sweet a morning's fun as there has ever been. Close to four hours later, Thelma dropped me off at noon, and Bertha took the fish I'd caught and put them on the stove, then told me, Me and Ed run down the road and got your car. He said be sure to tell you that he liked the way it drove. He'll be back in just a bit. He run to get some flour. And you don't owe us nothing. It was just a belt was loose. It had nothing else to do and loves to tank with cars. And I was glad to get a chance to put that man to use. There it was again. Another tiny town event. They did me such a favor, yet they saw it as routine. And I could not have told you what a tiny town was like before that day, but now I know exactly what they mean. Sadly, I have not returned for thirty-seven years, and like so many other ought-tos, where the same is true, I have often told my wife that, if we got the chance, going there to see those folks was something we should do. She'd agreed as many times, but still, we never did and my commutes for business ended many years ago. I'll bet today that Miller's Pond is hemmed by fancy houses, and if it is, to tell the truth, I wouldn't want to know. It couldn't have been too many years before they passed away, but I've relived that evening many times on starry nights, walking down that quiet road that led me to their home, I've heard their lovely music, seen the soft inviting lights, and both their smiling faces fill my very sweetest dreams. I've even smelled the frying fish that Bertha fixed at noon, and pie and ice cream always make me think about that night, for it was very special, and it ended far too soon. Still today, I've never had a better stroke of luck. That overheated car was like a blessing from above. And through the cherished moments of those tiny town events, I learned the art of kindness and the lasting power of love.